All right, open up your Bibles, please, to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, please. And we're going to go to verse 24. And the Word of God says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we, that is Christian, an incorruptible. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, Lord, and thank you for this chance for us to come together to learn more about you and your word. And Father, I just ask you to fill us with the Spirit of God to so be able to illuminate us with regards to the incorruptible crown this morning. And Lord, we give you thanks and praise for all things in our lives, but especially for the salvation that was wrought through your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. And this morning, we're going to continue our series here on the Judgment Seat of Christ, brethren. And we're going to look at the first crown, as we introduced them last week. But the first crown we're going to look at is the incorruptible crown. And you're probably wondering why Paul mentioned this to the Corinthian church, but the church at Corinth was uh, a Greek church that's in Greece okay. and they were aware of the Olympics at the time and they understood that there were many people who trained very hard in order to get that corruptible crown get that crown of leaves you've probably seen it laurels very famous okay. but that crown fades away it's made up of natural things and the entropy affects them and all this stuff okay. but Christian if you decide to strive and live for God in accordance with his word and be temperate you can receive an incredible crown in the future that's what we're going to look at this morning. Okay. And as we discussed when we did our little introduction on the crowns, we're going to look at the present application on how you can put on this crown spiritually in your life today. And then what happens in the future, part of which is you actually receiving it from Jesus Christ himself. Okay. So we're in 1 Corinthians 9, go to verse 26. And we're going to start right after that semicolon there. And the Bible says... So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. So Paul is saying, look, because of this crown, he's, in a, he's engaging in a present fight. Uh, 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. I'm going to look at those three sets of phrases right there, those three dependent clauses. Starting with, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body under subjection. Bring it under subjection. So what is he talking about there? What is this whole thing? Why am I fighting myself? What's he getting at? Okay. Well, one thing we need to recognize, brethren, is he often mentions the need to fight in a way that's temperate and in a way that allows you to master your being. Okay. And last week we saw in 2 Timothy 2 verse 5 that if we were striving for the masteries, we need to strive for them lawfully lawfully and that's referring to the law of God you see God actually tells us how to do this that's why we're taking our time here this morning even go through this uh, if God didn't have anything to say on the matter why even bother coming to church it's really a waste of time okay? but since God is a reality and the Christian life is a reality also the things he's mentioning here are a reality and he wants to make sure that you have everything you need as a Christian in order to deal with this battle and come out victorious and so, like it says in 1 Peter, the Apostle Peter actually says that we're not saved by corruptible seed, but by incorruptible, which is the Word of God. And it's that seed that you need to consume, spiritually speaking, in order to grow in grace and knowledge and actually win this fight. So if you want to keep your body under subjection, you have to do it in accordance with the law of liberty. That's what this book is. The Spirit of God, Christian, if you're born again and you've trusted in Jesus Christ, that Spirit lives in you. Okay? And He gives you liberty, but He does it through the Word that He wrote. Okay? So the Spirit takes these words and basically makes them real in your heart, and that manifests out in your life to where other people see that you seem weird and peculiar and different. Okay? And so Paul in this battle here, okay, he's expressing that he has to make a willful decision in his own soul to keep his body under subjection, to make sure that the spiritual is greater than the physical in his life, okay? to keep the proper order, if you will. Okay? 
And you might say, what's the point of fighting this battle? Okay? Can't you just get saved and, you know, everything's good to go. You got your fire insurance and everything, so, you know, just do what you want. Okay? Hey, I'm all about fire insurance. I got that in my house. Not a big deal, okay? It's important enough. You're supposed to have that thing. But there's more to the Christian life than just getting out of uh, dealing with the center of the earth. Okay, go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. One thing you recognize when you actually repent and toward God for your sinfulness, yeah, you recognize that, you know, you had an inner issue. You had a problem with your flesh, that you were your own worst enemy. And compared to Jesus Christ, the only person really anybody's worth uh, comparing themselves to, we fall short. Yeah. And Christian, now that God has given you the power and capacity to fight that battle against your old self, yeah, he tells you what you need to do to make sure you win. So now we're going to see why you need to actually fight this battle. Galatians 5, verse 16. Paul says again, This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Now why would he say that if it was automatic? Yeah. And to be honest, most things in life are automatic. We have to make choices in life. Yeah. And so you have to choose to walk with God. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Notice this contrast here. Okay. The flesh is referring in part to your body. It's also referring to your old man, your old nature, the way you were before you received Jesus Christ. Okay. We all have a life of that sort, so we should be aware at least of what we were like. Okay. And so verse 17 he continues, for, explaining verse 16, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other. They're completely contrary. They don't mix. Okay. So that ye cannot do the things that you would. So you see that you're in this battle against your flesh. You need the spirit of God to help you walk in accordance with him to win that battle. And you do that to keep the lust of the flesh down in your life. Yeah. It's true, Christian. When you're born again, you're not going to be sinless in the sense that automatically you're going to look like Jesus in your life. But you will sin less. So I have two several words. If you're walking in the Spirit. And you're going to want to do that. That's going to be your desire. Okay? This is why other people think you're weird. Yeah. All of a sudden, your desires change. But, you know, deep down they know that some of these things are good. They recognize that. And they seem different. Uh, you seem like one of those guys that they can trust in a, in a troubled time and all that kind of stuff. Okay, and that's because you're walking in the Spirit of God. Go to Romans 8. Romans 8. Romans 8 and verse 6. Paul discusses a little bit more about this conflict between the Spirit and the flesh. And he says in verse 6, for to be carnally minded, so now you see it's a mental thing, it's a spiritual thing, not necessarily just the body itself. Okay. To be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Okay. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. See that? So you have to walk in the Spirit in order to serve God, is basically what Paul's saying. Without that, you might think you're doing a religious thing that's cool and looks nice, and other people are going to hold you in high esteem for that. Okay? But God can look at your heart, and he knows the difference. Verse 13, Notice, for if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And Paul is trying to tell us that when you're seeking this incorruptible crown in your life, Christian, he wants you to get as much life as possible manifested in your being now. Jesus Christ promised us life and life more abundantly. Okay? But he's only going to work with you as much as you're willing to work with him. He's a gentleman. God doesn't force himself on anybody. doesn't need to. He's a creator. Of you. you need him. See? And so we see this struggle. Okay? What we need to basically choose to do is exercise godliness in our life. Because godliness with contentment is great gain, says Paul. Okay. You might say, well, what about keeping my body up? Okay, well, yeah, that profits a little. Okay. Imagine if I couldn't stand this morning. It would be pretty rough to actually give this message. Okay. 
if I had trouble walking, not because I broke my leg, but because, you know, I wasn't, I was eating a little too much or something, okay? That made me kind of useless to God. So it's important to take care of your body for these reasons. Okay? But more importantly, to take care of your soul and your spirit. So people can see Christ in you as you're living for Him. Okay? So I know uh, the brother he was asking about whether or not you should move to Montana and all these cool things. Okay? That's the ascetic lifestyle. I think God's against that. Okay, Jesus Christ himself showed that he wanted to work with the people exactly where they were, and he went to them. Okay? And he was able to exercise godliness in his life despite being around so many sinners, and he desires the same for us. Yeah, flee fornication. You need to avoid certain sins, no doubt, but don't go so far as I need to isolate myself. Okay? Part of your Christian walk, part of living in the Spirit, is showing Christ to others through you. Secondly, he said that he wanted to do that so that when he preached Christ okay, to others, he wouldn't be a castaway. Okay? In English, okay? imagine if I was living like Hitler and I'm preaching Christ. Okay? Pretty, pretty dumb. Okay? You're like, why should I listen to you? I mean, you're a murderer, obviously you're a hypocrite. Okay? This is the idea here that he's getting to. And th this actually goes even deeper than just that. Go back to 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. The reason why Paul brought up this crown was in part was because he received a, crush, a question from the Corinthian church about how to deal with certain uh, foods that were brought their direction. And in 1 Corinthians... Uh, oh, I skipped the whole section there. We'll go back here. I'll summarize this. Okay. We know why we fight. The key to fighting is recognizing that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, 1 Corinthians 6. And because of that, you need to mortify the deeds of the body and allow your members to be used as members of righteousness by putting on Christ. He's the key. So you don't have to go through all this, all this stress of, oh my goodness, how am I going to live for God? You just say, Christ, manifest through me. That's all it He does all the hard work. So God made it pretty easy. We're going to 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 20. It's pretty important to know. This is why people talk about Christ in you, the hope of glory. You're really trying to be like John the Baptist, who said that Christ must increase and he must decrease. You want people to see God in you. And the key is to put him on. Okay? Turn yourself off and put him on. But in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 20, Paul says interestingly here, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law. As under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, that's us Gentiles, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do, for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Okay. And so we're, now we're getting into how Christian liberty works. Okay. Paul is saying here, look, I don't want people to cast me away when I'm talking about Jesus Christ and him crucified to them. I want them to recognize that this is a serious, real thing that happened to me in my life, and this same God can save them. But oftentimes I might put me in a situation where it might seem like I shouldn't practice that because it's a religious thing or something like that. Yeah. Paul's saying, look, no. I use my liberty to reach Jews in the way they did, and I use my liberty to reach Gentiles. Yeah. And that liberty encapsulates the reality of boundaries. That's how true liberty works. Okay. Freedom, the way people think freedom is today, is basically anarchism. That's not going to work. Okay. Proper American liberty is based on the boundaries set by the Constitution, for example. Likewise, Christian liberty has bounds in Scripture. Okay. And so the biggest questions were with 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, were with food items. Because Corinth was a location where many people gathered from different parts of the world to do trading, and they brought their gods with them. Okay. Kind of like Chicago. Chicago is that place where everybody gathered for the trains and everything, and they all brought their different ideas there. And you wondered, how should I interact with these people? Okay. Indianapolis historically has a good history with that, too. 
But in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, Paul says here, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify not. Okay? Yeah, technically, because of the blood of Jesus and I'm saved, technically, I really could do any sin. And I would go to heaven, technically. But that's not expedient. That's actually a dumb thing to do, clearly. Okay? When you got saved, you recognized that sin was bad. Okay? And you knew that here, not just up here. Okay? And so now he's going to show you how to use that liberty you have in an expedient way. Verse 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man another as well. So you're thinking about the other person in this interaction. 25. Whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no question for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Okay. So, you know, you go to a fast food restaurant, I don't think you're too worried about what they're serving you. Okay. Don't talk to people about some of the horror stories they saw with some of the young people. Okay. When you hear some of that stuff, are they spitting your food and all that? Okay. That happens sometimes. That'll turn you off to some places. Okay. This happened in Buffalo. This is a New York thing. This is not an Indiana thing. Don't worry about it. Okay. Buffalo's kind of messed up. All right. But if you don't know about it, you protect your conscience and you can go ahead and eat without any issue. Okay. 27. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, so now you're invited to, I don't know, a family's table. They may not be a Christian. They may be, I don't know, Roman Catholic or something. Okay, Lutheran, Episcopalian, even something farther, like a Buddhist or something. doesn't matter. And ye be disposed to go. It's good to go. That's how you witness. you got to talk to people. Whatsoever is set before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Okay? You might be aware of some of the things they do with food. Okay? But don't ask about it. Just consume it. But, 28, but if any man say unto you, hey, look, this thing was offered to so-and-so. It was offered under one night. Now that you know about it, you see, and other people around you know about it, what choice do you make? 28. Eat not for his sake that showed it, and for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience that say, not thine own, but of the other. You're thinking about the other person. Yeah. You don't want them to attach biblical Christianity to that food item that they said was offered to idols. You want to show a distinction. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? Okay, that's what you don't desire. Okay, you're going to pray over the fool and all this? You don't want that person to think, well, he's praying over this. I know it was offered to an idol or something. Okay? You don't want that person thinking about that and using that against you. You want them to focus on the gospel when it's given. So then 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Famous verse, give none offense neither to the Jews nor to the Gentiles nor to the church of God, the three groups of people. We don't want to offend them through what we eat. We'd rather they get offended by the truth of the gospel. Yeah. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. You're probably wondering, when am I going to deal with this in America? To be honest, nine times out of ten you won't. But if you go to Colombia, like I've been, okay, and you're trying to work with people who live in shacks that are made out of wood or made out of clay, okay, and they got their little teraphim over there, and you see them put food in the, in the actual bowl there, that's where that actually matters. Okay? Or they tell you they made some soup, and you know they don't necessarily have beef, but they tell you it's beef soup. Okay, You pray over that, and you don't ask any questions. Okay, Because you're there to try to work with them. That's where this comes into play. Like I said, this is we're talking about crowns here, we're talking about people who are in service and they'll run into these situations. Okay. In America, the worst you're gonna deal with is what? Home home cooking? That's a blessing. Okay. Nothing, nothing bad about that. Alright. What else? So what about customs? Now this one you might see more. But Acts 21. Acts 21. Acts chapter 21 and go to verse 20, please. Now remember, Paul said, Give none offense to the Jews, Gentiles, nor the church of God, because even among Christians, there's a possibility of offenses coming. Okay? 
And this is where your strength as a Christian needs to be used in a way to not weaken somebody who's a little weaker in the faith. Now here's an example. In Acts 21, we have Jewish Christians talking to Paul. And in verse 20 they say, And when they heard it, when they heard the ministry of Paul witnessing to other Gentiles and Gentiles getting saved, okay, they glorify the Lord. There's a blessing here when people get saved. Always good. And said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. So we're talking about customs here. What is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. So these brethren understand what Paul's teaching really is, but he's telling, look, Paul, this is what they've heard. They're weaker in the faith. And when they hear you're, that you're here, they're, you know, they're going to gather. Okay? When the big preacher comes, people gather. Right? 23. Do therefore this that we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads and all may know that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. And, and this is tied to the Nazarite vow. Talking about shaving his head and stuff. For those who know a little bit about the Old Testament. So what they're saying is, look, look, uh, Paul, we're suggesting that you use your liberty in such a way that you do this custom so that those Jews will re realize that, no, clearly he's not against the law. I mean, look, he's going above and beyond with the Nazarite vow. That's something you take voluntarily. And sometimes you're going to deal with certain customs. Okay? I'll give you a, an Indiana example. Okay? I'm actually out of form right now. Okay? I don't have my pocket protector. Okay? My pants are not an inch off of the bottom of my shoe. All right? And so there are places that care about those things that are full of Christians. And let's say I was going to go preach there. Now, I can do one of two things, right? I can, one, I can be a rebel and say, I do what I want. Okay, these people invite me, I just go over there and do what I like. That's kind of messed up, isn't it? That's not taken into consideration their custom. Or, I can do like Paul and go above and beyond and try to fulfill as many of those as I possibly can, okay? Show that I'm reaching out and then go there and preach because they invite me. This is why it says, give no offense to the church of God. You're going to run into churches with people that are saved that are not as, as uh, I guess, strong as you are in the faith and have understanding on all these things. And so you take a step towards them using your liberty to bless them instead of trying to cause them to stumble. Okay. So we see here that presently, if you want to avoid, or if you want to manifest the incorruptible crown in your life and avoid sin, what you basically need to do is put on Christ Jesus and the Lord. He was always willing to reach out and have compassion to one that was under him. He always took the time to reach out. Yeah. For example, he actually decided that he must go to Samaria, a place where, oh my goodness, it's dirty. There's Gentile dogs there. He went there just to witness to one woman. That's the God I worship. One woman. That's how important she was to God. And so if we want to manifest that crown that is Christ Jesus wearing it on us, we need to make these decisions too. But now we get to the cool stuff. Now we're going to talk about the future. What's coming next, God? As you choose presently to manifest the incredible crown in your walk, your new man's going to grow. And so in the future, you're going to become more like Christ. Now what does that look like? 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24 again. Let's read this. And we're going to actually use some of these uh, phrases here as a base. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 24. Paul says once again, Know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So you're running this race, presently showing the crown, looking towards the future of receiving a prize. The prize of the high calling in Christ Jesus is what Paul calls it in Philippians. So run that you may obtain, and every man that striveth for the masteries is temperate in all things, verse 26. I therefore so run, not as uncertain. So we're going to look at those 
phrases there. Started with being temperate in all things. What is that? Okay. Well, temperance is about you having moderation in all things, being balanced. Okay. You're not so spiritual where you say, I can't be with so-and-so at all. Okay, that's the asceticism I was talking about, brother. I need to separate. Okay. Them, them monks, back in the 4th century, they were wrong doing that. But they weren't reading much Bible. You can read, you can see it in the writings. Okay. Likewise, you can't go too far the other side and say, okay, okay, I'm going to go hang out in the bar for months, and I'll eventually reach somebody with the gospel as I'm drinking. Yeah. Maybe you will, okay, but your testimony will get destroyed as a result. Because everybody there is going to be like, you're a Christian, you kidding me? You've been here for months. Yeah. Got to have a balance there. Okay. So, go to Titus 2, Titus 2. Paul describing things tied to temperance. Manny, are you saying you can't go to a bar? Yeah. Well, I've been to bars, but I was in front of, in front of them preaching against them. I wasn't really in them, but I actually went towards one. So it depends on how you look at that question. But Titus 2 and verse 1 Bible says, Thou therefore, my son, pretend God's talking to you, my son or daughter, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. What does that look like? And these things that thou hast heard of me among many... Oh, I'm reading the wrong verse. Titus 2, verse 1. I'm over in 2 Timothy 2. Those are good verses too. Titus 2, verse 1. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Yeah. And my thing is that learning and all this, that's part of it. But notice... It's tied to your conversation and your walk. Sound doctrine, you're complete, you're full, you don't have any error, there's nothing weird there. Okay? That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, and patience. That's a description of what it means to be temperate in all things. And as you continue to presently put on that crown, as you grow in grace and knowledge and you become aged in the faith, you'll manifest some of these truths and it'll just be part of who you are. People are going to know you for this. First off, being sober. Being sober. Okay. Being sober means that you're circumspect. You recognize what's going on. You'll be able to look at the current events of today, for example, and recognize that we're getting closer and closer to the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. It'll be evident to you that the world is actually getting worse, not better, in terms of spiritual things. I get that our technology is getting better, okay? but the 99% of people using that technology are not using it for, for the glory of God. Let's just be honest. Okay? And so we need to do that and be circumspect, be awake, basically, as Christians, so that we don't actually think we're standing without God. Because the Bible says, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Once you think you're doing good to go, like Nebuchadnezzar, this is all because of me, you fall. Okay. And if you're sober, you recognize that you need to keep on putting Christ Jesus on no matter how much you've grown. And that's what change. All you're doing is showing more of him. Okay. You can easily decide not to worm one day and you'll come out real quick. Okay. Trust me. I know that in my life. Okay. Got to be careful. Then it talks about being grave. Go to 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3. And verse 8. What does that old, you know, old archaic word grave mean? Okay. Well, it just means to be serious. Okay. Your Christianity isn't a joke. It isn't a byword. Okay. The word Christian has become a byword in Indiana. Okay. The word doesn't even exist in, in New England. Okay, so at least you guys got the word still. Okay, you, you see a Bible leader up there, they're like, what is this? I've never seen this before. Okay? But now everybody calls himself a Christian and none of them really know what God had, had to say at all. Okay? Why, why call yourself a Christian if you don't even know Jesus Christ? That would be my question to you. Okay? So you're serious about your faith, that's what it means to be grave. People recognize it's not a joke okay, when it comes to you. You're different. 1 Timothy 3, verse 8, the Bible says, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, so you won't be talking about people behind their backs, 
that. Not giving to much wine, not greedy for filthy lucre, so you're not Joel Osteen looking for money, okay, and you're not getting drunk. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. Okay? So if you're grave, you have a pure conscience towards spiritual things. You're like, uh, I believe it was Nathaniel preacher, right? Who Jesus Christ said he had no God? Was that Nathaniel? He looked at Nathaniel and saw a real Israelite indeed. God wants to look at you and say that, yes, you're really one of my children. You manifest that to others. Okay. You're serious about living for me. Okay. Why should God give you a crown if you're not serious about living for him? Does that, does that make sense? Okay. The people we love and care for and live for are serious about our interaction with them in their lives. That's why we take time and give them things. Okay. No different with God. He's the one who started it after all. Likewise, temperance proper, go to Titus 1, Titus 1 and verse 8. Temperate, like I said, balanced. Okay. But that temperance is going to come out in your conversation, the things you say and the answers you give, and the way you deal with people. Titus 1 and verse 8 says, But a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate. Okay. Holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine, and we just saw some, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. And this is what I was telling you. Sound doctrine is more than just you knowing, you know, where to find the doctrine of Christ. And, you know, you can go to first, or Second John verse 9, there it is. No, the reason why you're able to do that is because people know you're a Christian, so they take you seriously and take them to the Bible. That's how you're able to exhort and convince those who try to speak against the truth. Okay. They know you're not joking. Okay. And then lastly, that verse in Titus 2 said, Sound in faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You're sound in this. As you continue to grow in grace and knowledge, one thing God's going to have you do basically daily is read his word. And you'll get more of that in your being. And all of a sudden, it'll get to the point where you just can't help but say these things. Now, you're not going to be like, the Bible says in Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, you start quoting it. That's not how it comes out. You're just going to say, no, you're, you're saved by grace through faith. It just, it just comes out like that. It's part of your conversation. Okay? Now, you can do that. I quote sometimes. But not when I'm doing a one-on-one. -on -one. Okay? These things are coming out. They may not be aware, but they'll hear that, and it'll ring. and be like, that, that does sound really, really good. That makes sense. Because everything God says makes sense. Okay? If you didn't know. He is truth. Literally, he. He's the truth. Per truth is a person. Okay? Charity. Charity. Love in action. You don't just say you love somebody. You go out and show why you do. And we're to love the lost by giving the gospel. We're to love the saved by working with them to grow. And we're to love our family by doing both each and every day. With them. Because they're going to know you better than anybody else. You can't fake with them. Right? And then with patience, because you're going to know that the first, second, third, maybe tenth time you work with somebody, it may not work out. They're not going to get it. Okay? You got to let God work. You got to let God use you to work with their heart. You can't force them to grow. You can't force them to get saved. Okay? But you can pray for them. That you can do in patience. Okay? Now you do all these things in the future, people are going to look at you and say, well, you know, He's religious. Probably what you're going to hear. <laughs> I love that. It's a great, great way to give the gospel when somebody tells me that. Because I tell them that, that, did you know that my God wasn't religious? So that really throws them off. Yeah. I never heard that before. Likewise, uh, because you know all this, you're going to run, but not uncertainly. Paul is saying here that you're going to choose to live for God with a reality of knowing what's coming. Okay? You're certain that God's going to work with you. You're certain that God's going to help you grow. And you're also certain of what God's going to give you in the future. Okay? People who have the incorruptible crown are looking forward to incorruptible things. Does that make sense? Okay. For example, 1 Peter 1. I'll show you some. 1 Peter 1 verse 4. 1 Peter 1 and verse 4. 
Now don't get me wrong, I love my house, I love my cell phone, okay? I love my car, okay? but these things are way cooler. Okay? 1 Peter 1 and verse 4, the Apostle Peter says, this is what he's looking forward to, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Okay. What's that referred to? Oh, all, this, all the rewards we just talked about, the gold, the silver, the precious stone, all that stuff we're talking about in the series. Okay. And unlike the wooden hay and stubble that actually burn up, those stick around forever. See? That inheritance is undefiled. Remember, Jesus Christ himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, okay, he said, set your affection on things above, right? And you're going to lay up treasures in heaven. Something of that sort. That's what he said. Not here. Okay? Here you're going to get them spiritually in your life. Over there, God's going to give them to you physically. Okay? There won't be a scarcity of gold in heaven, okay? and when we're back here in the millennium as well on this earth, because God is here and gold represents him. Okay? Right now there's a scarcity of gold in part because this world isn't run by him. Okay? It's run by his enemy. But anyways, inheritance that's incorruptible. You're looking forward to that? Okay. What's weird is that if you're just living for God, you're going to get a whole bunch of this. It's automatic. Okay. All you got to do is make a decision to submit to the Lord. Likewise, and this is one you're going to hear preached a lot at this church, go to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Now I get it. I'm only 35, so obviously, you know, I can't be looking forward to this body, right, preacher? Oh, no. I haven't had any struggles yet. You know what? That's true. I've had some, but nowhere near some of the ones that some of my other brethren have had. Okay? But I know that this body is much greater than anything I've ever had in my life. 1 Corinthians 15, the famous resurrection chapter, where it talks about a bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why do we worship and follow Jesus Christ? He's the only man who ever physically rose from the dead, and it's a historical fact. It's not just some junk that was set up there in the streets. Okay? We're in 2022, year of our Lord. See, he, he was really here. And in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 50, Paul says, very interestingly, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. Okay, so our flesh and blood bodies are corrupted in some way. This is tied back to what happened with Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. Okay, the, the curse that came. The ground was cursed. Our bodies made out of carbon. Okay. Ground. But God knows this, so he has a plan. And so it says in verse 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Yeah. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. And you have an incorruptible body that you're going to give in the future. Okay? A body that won't fade away. A body that will never grow old. A body that will never get sick. A body that will never have any of these issues. And you know that because your Savior that you're putting on already has that body right now. When he rose from the dead, that's what he had. And he promises to give that to you. Okay. So Paul, with all the struggles and the fact that he had, he was writing in a large letter, maybe because his eyes were affected after what happened to him in Acts 9. Okay. He's looking forward and choosing to put his mortal body in subjection so that when he gets that immortal body where his eyes are clear, he can focus on his God even more. Okay. And he'd like to put some crowns on top of that glorified head, if you would. So that's basically what's going on with this incorruptible crown. My question to you would be, okay, first of all, okay, do you actually have the capacity to even get this crown? So you got to be saved. Okay. Secondly, if you are born again, okay, are you making the decision to live for God? Because that's really where it begins. That's all it takes. You don't need to know any of this, and you can still get the crown. Just because you chose to live for God and you followed His word. Good morning, man. Good to see you. Amen. And so let us pray here. Hold enough for questions. 
Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for showing us a little bit about this incorruptible crown. And just help us, Lord, to make the simple decision uh, to submit to you, God. Because submitting to you in our hearts will make sure that we can...